And so I'm gonna turn the recorder on. Okay, so don't forget to do this um, by Sunday, although if you want to do it earlier, again, that might help you. Um, and so you've got the forms to finish in this 25 point assignment uh, by Sunday. Any questions about that or? We're gonna meet again Thursday. So why don't you take a, a look at the assignment, the assignment sheet and a rubric, and you have questions, I can answer them on Thursday. Um, or you can shoot me an email. I'm pretty much answer email the same day I get them. So um, don't forget to do this last assignment. Now, what I wanna uh, also tell you is that our, our exam, exam number four, which there's a study guide for, let's see. So basically topic 12 down, there's a study guide for each one's PR, journalism, media effects and legal issues. That's gonna open up this coming Sunday uh, at midnight. And then it's going to run through Monday night at 11.55. So you'll have a 48 hour window to take the final. And of course you'll have it's the same size test, just like all the others you've had, you'll have an hour to take it. Um, and so um, just trying to, you know, one thing about having a week off is our brains get fussy. So finish your forums, do the uh, media report and your test is coming up. So work on those study guides. Um, any questions before I launch into the media effects? Okay. So Wait, I have a question. I'm sorry. Sure. So the last exam is our final. Yes. So the final is just a test over the last couple chapters. We're not having a comprehensive final. Okay. Just making sure. No, that's that's a very good question. I appreciate that. So no, I just decide not to have a comprehensive final. Um, again, we we normally have an extra week in the semester in which point I might have given you this exam the last week and then a comprehensive, but I just decided not to. So this test will cover um, basically PR, journalism, media effects, and legal issues, so four chapters. Um, and so um, that's good, I think. Um, now I'm gonna pull up the PowerPoints. We did not go over chapter 11 or media effects last week. I, I was afraid some people might skip before break. And so I'm, I'm gonna talk about media effects today. And on Thursday, we're gonna talk about the legal chapter. So you should be covered for the test that way. And you should now be able to see the PowerPoints. Is that, can you? Yeah, we can. Okay. I don't always trust the share function. I don't know why, but okay. I'm glad you can see it. So um, I'm just going to kind of walk through this lecture. But if you have any questions, feel free to just, you know, chime in, interrupt. Um, it it's, uh, won't be considered an interruption. Since I can't see you, that's really the only way to get my attention. Hold on one second. We had somebody else log in. I want to make sure I record Luke as being present here. Okay. Okay, so um, it really is kind of strange to be lecturing this way, but um, I appreciate all of you logging in. I know um, that uh, this has been a really good class. So today I want to talk about chapter 11 or media effects. It's one of the topics on um, the last exam. And so um, in a sense, it's we've been talking about media effects in a sense throughout the whole semester, but um, we haven't talked about it as sort of a, uh, a main topic that scholars have considered and, and they've been um, very fascinated by how the mass media affect us. 
Um, there are several learning objectives. I am not going to really read all these to you, but by the time you're done with this chapter, you should have some understanding of these different objectives. Um, early in the study of media effects, which was around the early 20th century um, to the mid 20th century, um, scholars really believed that media effects were extremely powerful. Um, and so we're going to talk about the power of it, how powerful is it, how direct is it, how long term, how short term, that kind of thing. Um, and we're also going to talk a little bit about how the media helps socialize us. Um, that sounds strange, but you know, when we're born, we don't understand exactly how to operate in our culture and our society. That's something that we're taught by our family and our friends and school and the media. Um, children today are exposed to the media at much younger ages. Um, and so the media plays a role in helping to socialize us in our culture. Um, it also, the media shapes and reflects our lifestyles. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, we also are gonna talk a little bit about stereotypes in the media. Uh, the mass media perpetuate a lot of the stereotypes we have and some of them are kind of benign but um, some of them are quite harmful and hurtful and um, none of them are really a good idea. Media should avoid stereotypes, but sometimes we're the culprits and perpetuating them. Um, let's see. There's also some interesting information. We'll get to a slide about subliminal messages. Do subliminal things really impact us or is that just some, something that people believe. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that. And of course, you can't talk about media effects without talking about media violence. What kind of effects does violence in the media have on violence in society? Is there a direct um, response there? Okay, so your chapter starts off by talking about Pokemon Go. And uh, I kind of chuckled at this because um, I have a brother who's uh, in his 40s and he has a son who's in his 20s and both of them play Pokemon Go. They get in the car and they drive around and they play this and it, it you know, I'm in my 50s and so it's always seemed very strange to me that a grown man and his grown son play Pokemon. But when I was reading this, it seems like this is quite the cultural phenomenon that uh, the book said that um, Pokemon Go actually has more users than I think it said Twitter, which I find really hard to believe, but it's quite the phenomenon and it, it does speak to the viral effects of the media in a sense. And, um, and I don't mean to laugh at it because some folks in this class may play this. Um, I just was surprised that my brother who is pushing 50 um, plays it, but it's one way he bonds with his son. But anyway, Pokemon Go uh, does speak to how the media can get ingrained in something in the cultural and kind of go viral and impact us. And it's had a tremendous impact in terms of just people who participate. Um, in the early beginnings of the media effects, when we had researchers and scholars who were very concerned about the media, they began to try to come up with models to explain it. Um, radio entered, you know, our culture in 1920, um, and it was very, very powerful. Uh, families would sit around the radio and listen to programs the way we watch TV today, and it had a tremendous effect. And then uh, television comes around, and it really emerges into our popular culture about 1948. And television added not just sound, but visuals, and it is a very impactful part of society. There's no doubt that we are affected by television. Um, but in the early years of trying to diagnose this, um, scholars really thought it impacted us more than it did. Um, there's a model that your book talks about called the magic bullet model. Um, and what that means is, forgive the graphic nature of this, but it's the theory that was espoused um, a long time ago in the 20th, um, early 20th century that says that 
the magic bullet is like a bullet that's in a gun and is shot into your head and feeds you full of the media. So it's like the media is sent directly into your brain. And um, so you watch something on TV and boom, you're completely affected by it uh, directly by this magic bullet. Um, that gives the media tremendous power. Um, and the truth is it's not that powerful and scholars came to believe that. Um, a, a similar theory is that is the hypodermic needle theory. And that is a theory that just like a shot, I take a shot and put in your arm and the effects of the mass media go directly into your system like medicine and impact you. Well, hypodermic needle theory and the magic bullet theory both give the media way too much power because what it does is it says that the media is more powerful than the consumer because we as consumers actually do think critically and we respond to the media differently. So Nick or Emily or Nathan or Paige or Sierra and myself, we could watch the same program and we could have six or seven different responses to that program. So if the hypodermic needle or the magic bullet were true, we would all watch the same program and all have the same response to it. So the powerful effects theory gives media way too much power and gives the consumer way too little power. And so those have been discredited uh, over time, but it's important to know that they existed as we try to figure out how powerful the media is because they do affect us. They just, it's just not like medicine. Immediately they enter our system and we're changed. Um, one theory that's kind of interesting is one that's called the third person theory, this one here. And that idea is we're not affected by the media as much as we are by someone we might know that uh, is influential with us. So um, someone on the media or someone talking about the media, a third person, someone like, I don't know, maybe Oprah, not on her show, but in some other way, or Barack Obama or Donald Trump or whoever you see as influential, if they think something, we might be more inclined to think like they do or influenced by them than simply watching a political show. So the bullet model, um, was very, very intriguing, but it was pretty, um, pretty much discounted by the minimalist model, which is our next one. Uh, the minimalist model says that the media affects us, but minimally. <laughs> so it sounds like um, how it's described. And so um, the minimalists look at this as more like a two-step flow model. So um, something is on the media and then we're, um, we see other people. And so there's this flow of information from the media to somebody who um, is influential and then we might adopt it. But it's something where it's, you know, not just immediately into us, but it's more like there's a two-step flow of information. The one thing the media can do is they can confer status on different people. So if you're in the media a lot in a positive way, they can confer you as an important public opinion leader. Um, if you're in the news a lot in a negative way, they can confer upon you negative status or they could erode your status. And so one thing minimalists say is the media does uh, impact a person's status or an organization's status. That's not quite the same thing is just brainwashing us like medicine in a needle. Thirdly, one of the things I thought was interesting in the book was the narcotizing dysfunction. Okay, that's a term in the, in the book. And what that means is we're so inundated with um, media messages that we, it kind of lulls us to sleep or we just count them because there's too much to process or there's just so much out there I kind of felt that way with this last presidential campaign. Not that people weren't divided and there wasn't a lot to think about, but I just got so tired of all the campaign commercials that I tuned them out. 
uh, whether they were for the person I was for or not. Um, and so they kind of, I just couldn't wait for the election to be over so we could stop hearing all the commercials. So sometimes the media can lull us to sleep. And that's what that means there. Okay, before I go on to the cumulative model, does anybody have a question about any of that? Are y'all good? Kind of going over it fast, but. I'm good. Okay, Tanner has joined us. I'm gonna put Tanner down on the roll sheet. Okay. Okay, sounds like everyone's good. So, um, the cumulative model. So first we had, you know, the powerful effects theory that uh, the media is so powerful that it overtakes our mind and, our thoughts and kind of controls us. Then you had kind of the min minimalist that says, yeah, it, it, it confers some power, but not nearly what we thought. Well, then comes another scholar who talks about the powerful effects of the media, but not short term, but over time. And so the cumulative model basically says that there's a cu cumulative effect of the media on your life over time. And I think that's undeniable. Now, the problem is how much um, are we, I don't think we're controlled by it over time, but it does help socialize us. It helps instill values. It helps do a lot of different things. So I think the cu cumulative model is probably a pretty good one that you know, maybe I don't listen to something today and I'm dramatically changed, but over time, how changed am I by exposing myself to the media? And I, I'm thinking a lot about television as I'm speaking, but it's, it's really all media. Um, and so um, there is a real cumulative effect. I, I don't know that you can quantify though how much, like, person A is affected this much and person B is affected that much, that the fact and effect exists, I think is undeniable. Okay, so that was a bunch of theories and, and they're kind of interesting. Um, more applicable is sort of how the media affects our lifestyles. So I already kind of said that socialization, um, especially especially early in life, there's kind of an initial socialization as you're trying to figure out how to navigate this world, right? When you're a kid. And when I was a kid, the media probably played a much smaller role because I was born in 1962 and um, my life did not involve around the media too much until I got maybe in high school. Um, we, when I was a kid, we had three channels on our television and, you know, uh, we had kind of a traditional family where my dad kind of controlled what we watched, not in a mean way, but, you know, we had like gun smoke. We had like three or four things we could watch. We didn't have anything like social media. We didn't have tablets. We didn't have computers. Um, I didn't read the newspaper as a kid or read magazines. I read textbooks for classes. And so the media played kind of a, a role in my life, but relatively small till I got older. But I suspect your generation that had tablets and cell, uh, cell phones and um, you know multiple media channels, I don't even know how many channels I have with Spectrum, but I, it's several hundred. Um, and so the media is much more dominant in our life today and plays a bigger role in socializing children to their society. I was listening to TV a week or so ago and they had a psychiatrist on and they said during COVID that probably small children are getting way too much screen time because now the screen time is their school as well as everything else. And then some parents are having to work from home. And so the tablets and computers and things are their babysitter too. So they were saying it's hard to know now what the effects of COVID-19 will have on children who are now spending their waking hours on screen time. Um, hopefully it's not affecting us too much because I'm spending more time on screen and I know you are too. Um, so there's a socialization factor. And um, one of the things about our media today 
is it's sort of a pro-social factor. So what the book meant by that is that um, the socialization we re receive is about being socially responsible and about being proactive on things like it teaches us to recycle and it teaches us to um, not litter and things like that. And so there's a, a pro-society spin to what the socialization is, which is a good thing. Um, living patterns. Uh, the media does talk a lot about lifestyle and it has changed through the years. Um, again, I, I'm not trying to point out how old I am, but um, television in the 50s and 60s was much different than the television today. Um, for instance, when I Love Lucy was on television, Lucille Ball became uh, pregnant in real life and they didn't know what to do because you weren't allowed at that time to say the word pregnant on television. And so they didn't know how they were gonna write into the script how the main star was pregnant if they couldn't say the word pregnant. So they um, kind of wrestled with that idea and finally, they decided, you know what? She's pregnant in real life. So the, the character is going to be pregnant. And we're just going to say the word pregnant. And, and that changed the norm. And the network had to let them. And it was very popular. The whole storyline about you know Lucy and the show having a kid was a very popular storyline. And it's kind of hard to believe today with what we can see on television that you couldn't even say the word pregnant in the 1950s. Um, also, if you watch old shows on TV land, uh, you'll see people like um, on the Dick Van Dyke show, if you've ever seen a rerun of that, that he and Mary Tyler Moore were married on the show and sleeping in separate beds. And then today, you know, you watch things like there's a, I think there's some kind of show called uh, Naked Dating. And definitely the discussion of um, sex and things is um, very uh much a part of today's programming. And so over time, uh, society has changed and media has um, basically reflected that and shaped that. Um, that leads to the next one, the intergenerational eavesdropping. Um, one of the things it says is that the media today has kind of eroded boundaries. Um, when I was a kid, uh, probably certain topics were not talked about in front of me. They either, you know, would whisper behind the back or they just wouldn't talk about that in front of kids. Things like, you know, um, sex, uh, like on a show like Friends. Um, I love that show. It was very funny. Still like it. Uh, but, you know, every episode mentions something about sex. And so that was something that wouldn't have happened before. And so the book had a, a joke in it. Um, you know, which is a little bit corny, but it basically, the joke in the textbook said, uh, one father told a friend, I had my talk with my son last night about the birds and the bees. And the friend said, well, what did you learn? Because the notion is that because of and it's kind of eroded these generational boundaries. Um, and Social media uh, also has changed things um, generationally um, in sense of uh, we're more connected and more avenues, there's more platforms for connecting. Um, and so that has really changed things. Anybody have any questions about this slide before we go to the next one? Okay, hearing none, we'll, we'll move forward. I just want to Sometimes I just kind of talk and want to make sure if you have any questions that you can um, ask them. Okay. So we talked about uh, theories of media effects. We talked about lifestyle. And of course, people change their opinions and attitudes all the time. And one of the things that affects them is um, the media. And so, the mass media does influence opinions. If it didn't, people would not spend billions of dollars on advertising. People would not go on television and Twitter and other platforms and channels to try to influence us 
if it wasn't possible. So our opinions are um, able to be influenced and shaped by things. Sometimes we know it and sometimes we don't. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, my sister and her husband were watching a documentary on how poultry farms treated chickens. And I guess that's pretty bad in a lot of places. And so they watched this programming and saw how brutally chickens were used um, or treated. And now they won't eat anything but cage-free eggs. And so they watch that and they're like, we're never eating anything but cage-free eggs. And as a result, that's what I do too, because it doesn't cost me anything. But I never would have really thought about it had they not seen that program and then they tell me. And so there's not always a direct effect like that, but sometimes there can be. Um, that's why documentaries are made. Um, some people are more malleable than others. Um, and so it kind of depends on what your opinion is. Uh, and so there are also very slow influences. Like over time, you might think of something. Um, you know, you might have right now at your age, perhaps, and I'm projecting here because this was true of me at your age, a lot of your value systems are the same value systems you learn from your parents and you think like they think. And that was certainly true of me. And then over time, some of those values might change. Now, I still have most of the core values my parents taught me, but there are some things I think differently about them than what I was taught. So over time, your beliefs will become your beliefs. They won't just be your parents' belief anymore. So there are slow influences on us um, over time. Um, causal explanations um, explains what I just talked to you about with the cage free eggs. Uh, something happened, they watched this program, it changed how they felt. 9-11 uh, was a causal um, event for many things. It changed the way our airports run. It changed security in society and it changed a lot of different things. Whew, just taking a breath for a second. Okay, so role models uh, are important for us too. The media perpetuates role models for us. And we can all think of a bunch of different people who are role models. Um, some of them are um, more significant than others. Um, some role modeling make people do things that are kind of artificial. For instance, when the show Friends first came out, it's undeniable that Jennifer Aniston has beautiful hair, right? So um, one of the things that happened when that show first came out is a lot of women uh, try to get their hair cut just like hers because it was a beautiful um, hairstyle. Uh, she also wore sort of like pendants that hung down and people began wearing pendants like that. And so that's kind of an artificial way to role model. Way before uh, your time, uh, one of the figure skaters, uh, Dorothy Hamill, had kind of a unique haircut. And people of that generation, when she competed in the Olympics, people would go in and get the Dorothy Hamill haircut. So those are kind of small ways, but there are other ways that maybe if there's somebody um, more substantive, like a politician or a community leader that you look up to, you might role model some of their beliefs and values and that kind of thing. So role models have always been a part of the media and part of society. Now, the mass media, if, the mass media um, also sometimes engages in stereotypes. Sometimes they know that unwittingly, they just kind of do it because it's ingrained in culture. And it's kind of the chicken and the egg thing. When did the stereotype occur? Did the media cause it or did it already exist and the media just use it? Um, but a lot of the stereotypes are bad. Uh, and so we, uh, those of you in the class are going on to be media practitioners, you need to help people break those stereotypes. For instance, if you were shooting a film, if there are any filmmakers in this class 
And, you know, this is kind of old school, but you were shooting a Western. It used to be you would put a black hat on the bad guy and a white hat on the good guy, and everybody would know who was good and bad. That's a ter terrible stereotype. And so, um, you know, it associates black with bad and white with good. And uh, that's a stereotype we should get away from because that's absolutely um, a hurtful a destructive stereotype. And so the media perpetuates those things, um, but we should try to break those if we can. Just think about Star Wars. That's one of my favorite film franchises. Darth Vader is dressed all in black. Um, and so again, uh, the stereotype is not good. Uh, they exist and we as consumers need to know that. So we too cannot perpetuate the stereotypes. Um, newspaper editors um, sometimes use stereotypes um, because they communicate quickly. You know, if you put a stereotype in a headline, if you call somebody a college jock or something like that, or you call them, I don't know, a Southern belle, people conjure up images, but that's not good. I mean, I think you should use better terms. Um, and so stereotyping is something that you should avoid in your writing when you go to write papers and um, just be aware that stereotypes are bad and destructive. And it's part of the reason we can't get over a lot of our problems in society. Some of those stereotypes are sexist, some are racist and, you know, really add any ism there. Uh, agenda setters. There was a, a theory that has been proven, I think, correct, uh, that the mass media doesn't tell us what to think. They can't inject in us what to think, but they can tell us what to think about. And they do that by, that's what they put on their TV stations, that's what they put in the newspapers. There are things, even with the internet, that there's not room to put in. So the media will put certain stories in and leave certain out. And by doing that, they're telling us what's important and what's not. And that's probably one of the biggest influences of the mass media today is the agenda setting function. Now with the internet, that's lost some power because there's room for more and more information, but you still can't put all the information in the world uh, out there because somebody has to process it. So again, agenda setting is not telling us what to think, but telling us what to think about. So that's really, really powerful. Okay, so how are we doing on time? Oh, we're doing great on time. Okay, so we had theories, we have lifestyles, we have attitudes, and now what are some of the cultural effects of the mass media? Well, one of the things the mass media does is it transmits our historical values from generation to generation to generation. So the things that we believe about our country, we believe because the mass media has, um, you know, passed them on. Uh, the book lists several examples of what this might be, but for example, one thing would be the American Revolution. Americans see that as um, you know, colonies fighting for independence and freedom and freedom of thought and speech. And I'm sure Britain, England saw that differently. They saw us as breaking away and being traitors and that kind of thing. But we pretty much transmit our American revolution in the same way for generations. And so it perpetuates the same historical values. There are lots of archives where this information is, uh, is stored and your book lists several, but um, one of the ones that I'm familiar with is in Nashville, Tennessee, where I used to teach, uh, Vanderbilt University has a television archives. And so if there's some great moment in TV history that you wanna know about, you can contact them and they probably have the film um, archived to where it can be viewed. It's kind of like a library. Now, I don't know if you have to go there in person or if they can transmit things digitally to you today. I haven't used that archives, but I'm, I'm aware of its existence. 
So it, it transmits our history, but it also transmits contemporary values, the values of today. Um, there's uh, the values we have um, in contemporary transmission can in include a lot of different things. Uh, how we feel about the election, how we feel about Congress, how we feel about religion, and um, a lot of different things. Um, and so a lot of the values that we hold today continue to be transmitted. The book talks a little bit about diffusion of innovations, and that means sort of how quickly new innovations are adopted. And um, we've seen that with different technologies in the media. I think cultural imperialism, we see here, it's a very interesting concept. Um, the notion is that America is so powerful in its media presence that that American Western media presence has kind of overtaken the rest of the world and that we've kind of colonized the rest of the world through our mass media. That, there might be a little truth to that, but the truth is that the rest of the world has a pretty good media system too. And so um, there are uh, plenty of examples of other countries that um, have their own media strength. One example that the book talked about was Hello Kitty. Okay. So, and it has even pictures or Hello Kitty is actually a global figure, but instead of the Americanized version, each country kind of has its own version of how they culturally depict Hello Kitty. So if you look in the chapter, they even have pictures that show that. So what they point to that to kind of show that uh, Hello Kitty is a global figure, but each different country depicts it differently. So it's not completely westernized. And so um, that, that the cultural imperialism has kind of been um, debunked, if you will. And there's a transcultural enrichment. So more than one culture has become a part of that. One thing that uh, the book talks a little bit about is how media have influenced the immigration debate um, in terms of um, immigrants coming to this nation and that kind of thing. Um, and so, I mean, I think it does that a lot through the news media it does it a lot through the depiction of different shows. Um, there have been different TV shows about immigrants, some funny, some not. Um, and so I think that impacts culture as well. You guys hanging in there with me? Looks like you are. <laughs> yeah, okay. we are. Appreciate it. Okay, let's go on to slide five. So, we have theories, we have lifestyles, we have attitudes, we have culture. And then the fifth main area is how does the media make us behave differently? Do we watch the media and then act differently? Um, on one level, I like to think that's not true, but, but it obviously has some impact, whether or not it's enormous or whether or not it's direct or long-term. Um, some are motivational messages. Uh, there are some people that speak that when they are on television, I want to hear them. Um, regardless of party, I like to hear the president's State of the Union address, whether the Republicans are in charge or the Democrats. Part of that is because when I was a reporter, I covered Congress and I always covered the State of Union address in person. And um, so that's always kind of intrigued me. Now I like to watch it because even though most presidents, I think in almost every presidential state of the union, they always say the state of our union is strong. Um, sorry about that. Um, and so they're usually kind of PR speeches about how great the administration is. I still like to watch them because they're kind of important to our culture and our politics. And um, so um, there are certain people I want to hear. Um, the book talks a little bit about hidden messages or messages that um, are subliminal. And there've been different researchers who've talked about this. Um, there have been studies done that seem to indicate that hidden messages work, but then some of those have been debunked. And so one of the questions that your book asks 
is um, are hidden messages, subliminal messages, only effective like in a laboratory when they're doing the experiment. Um, I, I assume that uh, there's subtleties that do influence us, um, but the research on that is debatable. Um, Jim Vickery, ah, I'm drawing a complete blank. Uh, Jim Vickery claimed to, uh, I read this just this morning, I reread this chapter, but I'm gonna go back to where Jim Vickery is because I kind of drawn a blank. So many different guys involved in the research. Give me one second. Okay, on page 201, the book talks about Jim Vickery. And um, some people thought that the idea that there were hidden messages was kind of crazy. Like you, you can't really just put hidden little messages that we don't really see consciously and then we do things differently. But um, Jim Vickery was a market researcher guy and he inserted messages like drink Coca-Cola and eat popcorn, he said as little subliminal messages in movies. And then theoretically, people went out to the concessions and got more popcorn and drinks. Um, and so um, he sort of promoted the idea of subliminal messages. Other people kind of said, this is crazy. So you can kind of read that section on, starts on page 201 for yourself. But there is a term called subception, which is the idea that there is some subliminal message out there that does perhaps affect us. And so um, that's an interesting concept that we could be watching a movie and then they put the words like popcorn or cola that are just so quick that we don't see them except subliminally. And then we might go do something that's an effect. I don't know. You can make up your own mind about that. Um, and then this is our last section of the book. Um, and it has to do with behavior in regards to violence, because that's been a real concern of scholars since the beginning, um, early, early 20th century about, are we more violent because our media is more violent? Um, one of the things, just a little history of this, um, television was not very violent and movies came along and uh, one of the things that movies could do that television really couldn't was movies were able to depict more violence initially. And so as movies begin to depict more violence, more sex, more things like that, television began to do that in order to compete with movies, which is kind of interesting. Um, in terms of violence, yes, can small children watch violence and pick up those um, there's a researcher in the book, I believe it's Albert Bandura, who says that, or maybe it's George Gerbner, but one of these guys says that one out of 10 um, characters is violent in, in, in a media programming. And so um, there's this feeling that if you watch too much violence all the time, you too can become violent. Now, again, the consumer processes information different. And so if you take five people and they watch something violent, um, doesn't mean they're all going to become violent. I, I would assume not because there's a lot of violence now on television and the movies and other media, and we're not all a bunch of violent people. Um, Albert Bandura did a study in children in which he showed them violence and he saw um, more violence in the children who saw these programs. And so he said that definitely violent programming or, or media violence could be an aggressive stimulation in children to make them more violent. Uh, other people said that his study was flawed and that ch children kind of naturally can be aggressive without having been stimulated. Uh, there's a model called the catalytic model where media kind of is a catalyst for violence. And then the last one is a guy named George Gerber, and he talks about the socially debilitating effects of violence. Um, one of them is it makes us kind of desensitized to violence. 
Um, it makes us more casual about violence because we just see it all the time. So even if we ourselves don't become violent, it desensitizes us to it. Um, media, violence, and youth. Th there continue to be a debate about this because children and youth up until a certain age, their minds are still developing. And so if you see violence at a younger age, does that affect your brain? And so that's one reason why, you know, movie uh, rating systems, you're not supposed to see certain programs, you know, if you're 17 or younger, um, because youth can make a big, you know, difference um, in terms of whether or not media affects you. Um, the desensitizing theory is um, significant. And there's a, a project about how you assess violence in ongoing way. So violence in the media remains a big deal today, even though uh, the effects of media aren't as powerful as we once thought, nobody suggests they're not there. Um, and so how much is, is the question. So today we went over the effects theories, lifestyle effects, attitude effects, cultural effects, behavioral effects, and violence effects. And um, so these are some of the main concepts out of chapter 11. And um, I, I hope you uh, get a sense of how difficult it is to really study and measure these in any kind of concrete way. We have a sense of the effects, we feel them, but we don't always um, know exactly how it happens because of all the people logged in here today, we would all be affected differently based upon our own critical nature, our own ability to discern things and our own predisposition to things. I would perceive some things differently than you guys just because I'm a different generation. So the media affects us, um, how much we, we still don't entirely know. And that's kind of that chapter in a nutshell. Does anybody have any questions or concerns? Okay, I'm gonna let you go. I'm gonna stop the recording and sign you off. Uh, I will say, finish your forums today if you can, and then work on your media report, get that knocked out, and then you can just study for the test, which opens up Sunday and runs through Monday. Um, but email me if you had any questions and um, thanks for logging in today. I, let's see here, stop the recording.